This exhibition, uh, Noah Purifoy Jonctado, was co-curated by myself, Franklin Sermons, and Yael Lipschitz. And I think one of the interesting things for us was that we both came to the work from different angles. Uh, I did not know Purifoy, whereas my co-curator did. She had a personal relationship. For me, the exhibition is something that I thought about for a long time because there were so many artists of another generation uh, younger than him, that always spoke about his influence. Artists like Senga Nangudi, artists like Marin Hassinger, artists like David Hammonds, Mel Edwards, it goes on and on. He had a really profound impact on a group of artists working here in Los Angeles in the 1960s and 1970s in particular. So we were both drawn from these two different angles, and I think that's something that we tried to bring out in terms of the title, as you see, it's not just Noah Purifoy, it's Noah Purifoy Junk Dada. And that was sort of a nod to, I guess, the two um, foundations uh, aesthetically from which he came. So on one hand, this acknowledgement of an idea that uh, Purifoy's work embodies, which is this idea of making something out of nothing. And, and so much of his work stems from that idea. Uh, Purifoy would go through um, materials like junk and garbage that people had left and of course he made a very profound work in 1966 called 66 Signs of Neon which is made directly from the refuse of the Watts Rebellion here in Los Angeles in 1965. So he has this interesting connection aesthetically to material and of how to make things. And it's something that has also a resonance, of course, with Arte Povera. And that is an important, I think, segue, an interesting part in why we call it Junk Dada, because uh, we wanted to make an acknowledgement, I think, of how important, on the other hand, if he comes from this space and being born in Alabama in 1917, a very uh, segregated time, one in which, you know, he had a conception of art and aesthetics that probably had more to do with a folk culture or a vernacular culture. Things that were made perhaps to be used as much as they were made to be uh, admired. Um, he came here, of course, and ended up, after working at the Los Angeles County Hospital, he ended up work, or, or going to CalArts. And uh, at that time, of course, it was called Chenard and he was there for four years. And in that time, he's also taking in art history, he's looking at galleries, he's looking at museums, and it had a profound effect, I think, from another side. Thus our title. And, and I think that effect can be seen very, very clearly in the exhibitions and the conversations that were happening in LA in the 50s and 60s. So you had a person like Ed Keenholz whose work Purifoy has been compared to in the past, who also was working with an idea of found material, an idea of a sort of rough aesthetic uh, that had as much to do with the grittiness of life as it did with uh, making objects. And then the reference point for us was important with, with Dadaism in that in 1962, Walter Hopps, the curator at the Pasadena Museum of Art, did an exhibition on Kurt Schwitters. It was the first large exhibition on Twitters in the United States. The following year, he did an exhibition on Marcel Duchamp. So you have these two pillars in long-term exhibitions here in Los Angeles at that time. That was a wide discussion for all of the artists that were here. And I think Purifoy took a lot from that experience. So four, five years after that, Walter Hobbs is actually the curator who took Purifoy's 66 Signs of Neon and displayed it in Washington, D.C. at the Washington Gallery of Art. So there are these really interesting connections between an aesthetics of a vernacular culture that might be more of a folk-based culture and how it intertwines then with something that is learned in a more academic setting and something that is learned from speaking with one's peers and curators and collectors. And Purifoy was a part of that conversation. So that's kind of how we came to the idea of Noah Purifoy, Junk Dada. Seven, Noah Purifoy, 
Broadway sculptor and artist has found the perfect studio for his expression, Joshua Tree. Where the artist moved to from Los Angeles six years ago, here he has the space to create, but the artist's inspiration for his material is more scarce. The jump was more accessible in a large city than in a small town. The Golden Ball sculpture were among the first because Golden Ball were accessible at about two dollars each. Right. This work following the Watts riots became seared the consciousness of the art world. Today, the founder of the Watts Tower Art Center still likes to work with charred wood. The desert, the artist's studio. It permits you to feel the, the, the breath. And from Los Angeles, six years ago, here he has the space to create, but the art. Some of the works have become collaborative with nature. There was the dove who washed intently. Appreciating what I was doing. Come to find out, she was waiting for me to back away far enough because. There are um, a couple of reasons why I think Purifoy's work has come to the fore again now. And one of those is uh, the great investment that was made by the Getty a few years ago in terms of starting Pacific Standard Time. And so that was in 2012. And they funded a, more than a series of exhibitions at most of the institutions in Southern California all at the same time that were dedicated to the history of art in Southern California between 1940 and 1970. Purifoy was a big part of that conversation. He ended up in no less than four or five exhibitions at the same time uh, during Pacific Standard Time. And you could see how here he might fit in with artists who make things out of uh, nothing, artists who make things out of junk, uh, how he then also could fit into a conversation around art and activism, because we can't forget that in addition to making great art, Purifoy was also a major activist and was the co-founding director of the Watts Towers Art Center in 1963. So he had these different places that he fit in as a sort of primary character. And from that, we could see very easily that it was time to take a more focused, perhaps monographic look at this artist. So that was sort of how it happened here. I would also say, additionally, that Purifoy, you know, his reception, uh, say, in the 1980s uh, was was tepid. I mean, he had a job. He worked for the California Arts Council. He was not able necessarily to make his work and only do that in order to survive. So he ended up going out to Joshua Tree in the desert in 1989 and spent the last 15 years of his life there. Although only a couple hours from here, it is a place, you know, we call it is the desert. And, and it does sort of, I think, uh, engender a life of, of solitude in some ways. And that's what he was, he was doing, and that's what he was about from 89 to 2004. He got up every day and he made art, and he did not have to have recognition from someone. It was, it was enough to be able to do it, and to do it on a really, really large scale. So there is that, that, that idea of let's take stock. Let's think about the work anew. We can also look at it in, in that example, and think of artists like Andrea Zettel, who has her um, large uh, foundation not far from where Purifoy was in Joshua Tree, uh, high desert test sites. We can think of an artist like Theaster Gates in Chicago, who has learned so much, I think, from art and activism and from making things out of nothing or discarded material, not nothing. Uh, so there is this influence that we begin to see in other artists that has, I think, drawn, you know, drawn a lot of interest.